Hello to everyone. Um, my name is Lucilla Guidi. I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker uh, and to welcome Alec Hinterwood. He's a postdoctoral level Hulme fellow and visiting scholar in philosophy at the University of Potsdam. His main research interests are in the philosophy of mind and action and in ethics, especially moral psychology. Moreover, his work is informed by Aristotle, Kant, Hegel, Marx, and psychoanalysis. He's currently working on a research project entitled The Work of Human Hands, Marx on Humanity as Solidarity. The title of his talk today is Marx and Rational Animality. Alec, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Lucilla. Hello, everyone. Uh, if I don't talk into this enough, just gesture and I'll, I'll start doing it more. Okay, so Marx and rational animality. Can you hear if I talk like this? Yeah, okay. Okay, <clears throat> Marx and rational animality. So, according to tradition, we humans are the rational animal. And in this talk, I want to introduce and explore the idea that our rational animality and our animality are a unity. Moreover, I want to suggest that this unity is to be comprehended from what Marx calls in his 10th thesis on Feuerbach, the standpoint of social humanity. That is, I want to suggest that the unity of our rationality and animality is grasped through an acknowledgement of the social character of the activity of human living. And that Marx, better than his Aristotelian or Hegelian sources, understood that activity and thereby the unity of our rationality and animality. Why does this matter? Well, <clears throat> if one's interested in the history of 19th century philosophy, then it's worth getting Marx right. That's not nothing, though I'd allow it may not be that much. Um, but my point here is also that Marx's contribution constitutes, as it were, getting it right, where that it is ourselves, the rational animal. Moreover, I think that by appreciating Marx's position, we clarify for ourselves, as philosophers, how the rationality of us humans involves an orientation against domination and towards sharing the activities of production and care through which we all live. In slogan form, in being the rational animals that we are, we humans are such as to commit ourselves to communism. We are such as to commit ourselves, that is, to abolishing private control over the means of maintaining human life. Of course, I don't think that those of us humans who will eventually do that abolishing, if we assume, of course, that we will all make it that far, will need any bit of philosophy like this. Nevertheless, I myself find this exercise in self-clarification undertaken as a philosopher in respect of my humanity to be of interest. Ultimately, I want to get clear in myself about the thought which animates Marx's Thesen, Thesis to Feuerbach, our human thought of ourselves, as I would put it. Which thought will be the same thought that those future revolutionaries will be thinking? Of course, they're thinking it will be then, rather than now. So by illuminating how the concept human being figures in our thought of what to do, and by recovering the radical potential of that concept, Marx's position might be seen today as a contribution to critical theory or to practical philosophy, if that's something different. This paper is preliminary. <clears throat> uh, philosophy is, is always prolegomena and so. Uh, this paper is preliminary, and that's because I won't get much beyond gesturing in the direction of Marx's position. Rather, I want to take a somewhat bird's eye view over the philosophical terrain <laughs> in order to begin to get into view at least what I want to call a return to Marx. I'll be happy if I only succeed in raising the suspicion that Marx differs deeply as a philosopher from Aristotle and Hegel, and that we philosophers limit our horizons if we think that Marx only presents, in admittedly stirring prose, policy recommendations which then need to be founded somehow on the more profound philosophical thinking of Aristotle or Hegel. Paper's meant to be a provocation, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I need to stop moving around. <laughs> Scheiße. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> if there's too much thumping, 
Yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> First, though, I must introduce the question concerning the unity of our rationality and animality. I should then suggest that while some contemporary Aristotelian Hegelian views seek to capture this unity, they nevertheless fail to do so. With this, I set the scene for my proposed return to Marx, since I think he implicitly has some diagnosis of what lies behind those failures and some idea of what li would lie beyond them. However, I'm then going to take a brief look over some contemporary Marx scholarship and critical theory, supposing I've not taken too long, uh, with a view to bolstering the idea that it really is a return to Marx that we need if we are to make proper sense of rational animality, if we are to make proper sense, that is, of ourselves. Okay. I just threw my watch on the floor, so. <laughs> okay, so a word first on the unity of practical rationality and animality. With unity, I mean the fact that our rationality and animality must figure for us humans together within our perception and action. My focus is on action, and with rationality, I mean the fact that as agents of goal-directed action, we humans represent what we do as good to do and know ourselves to act from such representation. With animality, I mean the fact that we know ourselves to be individual animals of the same general kind, namely the kind human being, to which kind we humans each give expression when maintaining ourselves by intentionally acting on perceived things. I'll pause before I carry on. By the way, there is a handout. The handout doesn't track what I say perfectly, but it allow you to kind of follow more or less where I am and, and you know, put an exclamation mark next to something when you want to ask me about it. Okay. Nevertheless, it can seem like our rationality and animality must be so to speak, two separate facts about us humans which merely get conjoined when we act intentionally. This conjunction can then be conceived in different ways. On the one hand, for example, perhaps being practically rational is only a matter of channeling, in accordance with our grasp of causes and effects, the force of the sensuous desires to which we are said to be subject, as animals of our kind, into movements which efficiently satisfy those desires. On the other hand, Perhaps being practically rational of itself puts us under certain requirements, not to lie to other practically rational agents, say, so that we must then limit, in recognition of those requirements, how our sensuous desires influence our movements. These conjunctive pictures, which I just sketched, have been attributed, fairly or not, to Hume and Kant, respectively. Here, being human is said to involve being both practically rational and an animal, but the apparent independence of those aspects from each other means that our humanity tends to capture, as it were, one aspect at the expense of the other. No conjunctive picture reflects how rationality and animality both figure for us humans as our own in one. You know what this phrase on the handout, I mean, in English you don't say in one, you'd say at once. But I saw Christoph Menke give a talk where he said in einem, in German is stronger. So I'm just transliterating. In einem, in one. <laughs> um, Okay, on the first picture, the more human one, it is our rationality which threatens to go missing, since it appears to be an optional, albeit useful, tool for calculating how to satisfy given desires with effective movement. On the second picture, however, we humans seem to be no more fundamentally characterized by our desires, and so by our animality itself, than we do by the particular objects with which we find ourselves surrounded. Our desires get construed as obstacles to be navigated with right movement. Now, dissatisfaction with these foregoing set of options and situation, which is, you know, those two options, partly explains, I think, the revival of interest in virtue ethics in 20th century moral philosophy. I hear a conjunctive picture of the unity of our rationality and animality has been resisted. Rather, it is claimed that our practical rationality and animality must be understood in terms of each other, the two being treated as coeval aspects of the single, complex fact that is our humanity. Somewhat more concretely, a rational animality is said here to reside in a set of shared, historically developed practices, which together constitute a determinate and intelligible way of life. By getting initiated into this way of life, we humans are said to form our given desires into the habits of feeling and action in which the practices of that way of life consist. So, uh, contemporary virtue ethics, broadly speaking. 
Furthermore, this development has led to sophisticated proposals for how to place such an understanding of human life within a broader, systematic conception of life as such. Here, the difference which rationality makes to animality in general is meant to be comprehended. Rather than treating our rational animality as a conjunction of two mutually independent aspects, these accounts take what it is to be an animal to be transformed, in some non-temporal non sense of transformed, by the presence of rationality in us humans. Rational animality is said to differ from mere animality, in which sensibility at least is present, comparably to how mere animality differs fundamentally from planthood. Okay, the foregoing development about virtue ethics and then uh, kind of, uh, transformative accounts of, of human life uh, behind it. This development can now be usefully divided, I think, into a neo-Aristotelian and a Hegelian branch. However, I think that this fault line threatens to reproduce, albeit in more philosophically sophisticated settings, the difficulties of the conjunctive pictures which I gestured at above. <laughs> This then motivates my return to Marx, particularly his critique in the theses on Feuerbach, the Holy Family, the poverty of philosophy, of both the materialism of Feuerbach on the one hand and the idealism of Hegel on the other. Here, I think, at least implicitly, Marx, diag Marx diagnoses what lies behind the offending dualism and begins to indicate what might lie beyond it, or what we should think if we don't buy into it. Um, Okay, having said that, I don't think that developing Marx's picture is completely straightforward. Uh, these never are. Uh, I think even the interpretive horizon of recent Marx scholarship can be seen to have limited itself to a near Aristotelian Hegelian axis. axis. And I think there's equally a danger that contemporary critical theory could reproduce versions of these same two branches. And so I turn towards this in the end. Um, try to make more pressing the idea that we need a return to Marx. Uh, don't yet have the materials. Um, so now I'm going to talk about neo-Aristotelian versus Hegelianism. Um, a note before I begin on this, why, why neo-Aristotelianism and Hegelianism? Why not neo-Hegelianism? Um, isn't that important, but I'll say anyway. Neo-Aristotelianism, I think, is not... It's a view which I think is found in Philippa Foote's work and, and to an extent in Michael Thompson's. I, I don't think it's Aristotle's own view myself. That's why I call it neo-Aristotelian. The Hegelian view, which I'll end up describing, I think more or less is Hegel's view, but I'm not enough of a Hegel scholar to, to try to substantiate that here, so I just hide behind the label Hegelianism. I get hauled over the coals by the true scholars in the Q&A, maybe. Um, okay, so in the first instance, I understand neo-Aristotelianism and Hegelianism to be views which fall within moral philosophy broadly construed, Acting intentionally or deliberating about what to do, we humans represent certain courses of action as good to do. I'm sorry, as goals to be achieved, and therein represent those courses of action as good to do. The question is to how to elucidate this concept of goodness. The Neo-Aristotelian proposes that with this concept of goodness, we humans apply to ourselves the same concept which we apply to any individual which we think to be alive. Uh, same formal concept of goodness, uh, you'll see why formal in a minute, and that human being figures for us as the species which determines this concept of goodness in our own case. Um, okay, so how then does the Neo-Aristotelian understand what I'm calling a formal, this formal concept of goodness? Okay, the Neo-Aristotelian claims that representing something as alive involves representing it as belonging to some determinate species, life form sometimes, oak tree, for example, grizzly bear, and that such a life form is itself represented with an interlinked set of grammatically generic propositions. So, for example, the grizzly bear, fa fi <clears throat> the grizzly bear fishes for salmon in summer, and it hibernates in winter. Taken together, uh, there need to be more of them, <laughs> such propositions represent the life cycle of that species. They display how mutually supporting and temporally sequenced activities make up the single activity of living a life of the kind in question. Grizzly bear life, say. Engaging in this structured activity over time, a living individual maintains itself as what it is, for example, a grizzly bear, and its species forms a standard against which we cannot but measure that individual and its actions. Is this grizzly bear doing what the grizzly bear does? <clears throat> the Neo-Aristotelian maintains, then, that human being is one life form where grizzly bear is another, 
and that human being constitutes a standard to which we humans implicitly hold ourselves when acting intentionally. Both we humans and non-rational animals are supposed to exhibit the idea of living as an act, the, the kind of broad idea of living as an activity. What it is good for us to do concretely is to engage in the activity of living a, a human life. Here, in per Aristotelianism, practical rationality itself is construed as an indeterminate feature of some living beings, like sightedness, for example, which can in principle be shared across species, but gets differently determined whenever it is. Compare, for example, how eagle sight differs from bear sight. Nevertheless, the neo Aristotelian maintains that younger members of any practically rational life form, in lieu of empirical inquiry, are provided with a determinate representation of their own life form, precisely by getting initiated by their elders into the practices which constitute that life form. Nevertheless, in us humans, for the neo Aristotelian, the absence of this determinate representation of our own life form, the absence, that is, of practical wisdom or virtue, is said to be a natural defect akin to blindness in bears. <clears throat> okay. Here it should be emphasized uh, as, a, as a matter of fairness, practical rationality is said to be a form to which the human being figures as matter. The picture is, if you like, hylomorphic. Um, practical rationality must be given content by some life form and any member of a practically rational life form, differently from the member of any merely animal life form, is themselves fitted to be practically rational. There's supposed to be no accident on this picture if an individual human being has grown up to, to think and to act justly. Comparably to how it's supposed to be no accident if an individual grizzly bear has grown up to see and to fish for salmon. The connection between our practical rationality and animality is thus tighter than on any conjunctive picture. <laughs> well, despite the best intentions of the neo Aristotelian, our practical rationality and animality still seem to me to come apart on this picture. Even though practical rationality is not construed by the neo-Aristotelian as an accidental feature of us humans, it remains abstract, since it is shareable across and must be given content by a potential manifold of different life forms, including human being, which life forms would be external to each other and each then differentiated from practical rationality itself. Ultimately, our practical rationality and animality remain independent aspects of ours, given neo-Aristotelianism, and I do not think they could be seen as fully unified in the intentional realization of our life form. Th this objection should strike you as question begging. If you, we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, the second strand within transformative accounts of rationality, rational animality may be called Hegelian. <clears throat> and this position, this branch of transformative accounts is helpfully seen as informed, I think, by the foregoing concern with the neo-Aristotelian view. Against an ultimately abstract conception of practical rationality, the Hegelian maintains that being practical rational must itself be a concrete activity of living, no less, for example, than being a grizzly bear is. For the Hegelian, then, human beings should not be seen as just one possible species within the overarching genus rational agent. Our species, human being, should instead be seen, as it were, as that genus itself becomes species. But how can practical rationality of itself have that determinacy which any concrete manner of living must have? On this Hegelian view, to be a human being, rational agent, involves being conscious of one's own sensuous desires and getting habituated out of an original prioritization of self-concern, born of that consciousness, into the general practices by enacting which we then, we humans then recognize each other as participants in the activity of ethical living. The determin determinations of this activity, of ethical living, are themselves said to have changed over time, having been sequen <clears throat> sequentially enacted by us in our historically extended differentiation of ourselves from non-rational animals. Okay. One second. For the Hegelian, then, being human involves getting habituated into practices whose participants recognize each other as equals. Participating in such a practice, a human being seeks to satisfy their own sensuous desires only whilst acknowledging the other participants' equal right to satisfy theirs. 
Furthermore, for the Hegelian, we humans comprehend our own history as a joint aspiration <laughs> towards practices in which we accord the same rights to all. In this respect, the advent of the modern nation state in, <clears throat> in distinction from previous feudal arrangements is seen to be especially significant. Since the universal rule of law under genuinely public institutions is supposed to emerge here. In the market economies which, which such states' laws hold together, we humans are said to present ourselves to each other as the consciously desiring individuals that we truly are. The concept goodness, which figures in our practical thinking, marks then the means to our privately desired determined ends, on the one hand, and on the other, the shared legal and political institutions by which the Hegelian thinks we have determined our common humanity. Ultimately, the Hegelian explicitly embraces a split between our practical rationality and animality. However, where a conjunctive picture treats that split as external, between two mutually independent factors, the Hegelian maintains that the split is rather internal, between two aspects of ours which are said to constitute each other. Um, the satisfaction of our sensuous, des our sensuous desires of which desires we are said to be conscious, gets limited by us in recognition of the institutionally enshrined rights of our equals. Whilst a practically rational agent, as an equal participant in this ethical life of ours, relates themselves to their own sensuous desires in just the same way. To live a human life, according to the Hegelian, just is to overcome one's own animality in living self-consciously with, in the end, other citizens of a state. Okay, so the, the, the dualism again, and Marx's diagnosis of it. I think that both of the positions I've described reproduce the dualism of, of our practical rationality and animality. More, moreover, I think that the neo-Aristotelian then prioritizes our animality over our practical rationality, in effect, and the Hegelian does the opposite. For the neo-Aristotelian, after all, character of our kind, human being, looks like a given fact about us which provides the matter for our practical thought, whilst our capacity for such thought can look like a mere means to our species' survival. For the Hegelian, on the other hand, our animality originally appears as the sensuous desires whose satisfaction we are habituated into being able to limit, with practical thought then being our learned capacity for prioritizing each other's rights over the satisfaction of just such desires. <clears throat> Our practical rationality and animality do not fully coincide, I think, on either picture, to the potential detriment of how deeply we humans may seem to be characterized by one aspect or the other. I said that my objection to the Neo-Aristotelian should seem question-begging. Say something about that now. Maybe such degrees of separation between our rationality and animality, these kinds of transformative account, are okay. Maybe such a degree of separation is exactly what a theory should aim to capture, and no more. <clears throat> Maybe my implicit insinuation that neo-Aristotelianism is just fancy humanism, whilst Hegelianism is just fancy Kantianism, is unfair. Perhaps one or the other view is just as fancy as a view needs to be in order to be true, and no more fancy than that. Otherwise put, I think, by unity, I seem to mean identity. And maybe that's just question begging. I mean, Aristotle in the metaphysics and discussing unity always is talking about a unity of diverse elements. Um, and that seems to be what these various branches of transformatism seem to be capturing. <clears throat> well, look, even if that were right, there would still be a question of which of the two views were right. Uh, Aristotelianism and Hegelianism. And there would be the related worry about one or other of them tending to prioritize one aspect of ours at the expense of another. But I'm not going to try to adjudicate that dispute because I think the, I think the implicit dualism in those accounts, both of them, reflects a deeper problem, one that Marx was on to. Um, I think that in some of his early works, Marx implicitly had a philosophical diagnosis of why any dualism between our rationality and animality appears, along with a description of some of philosophical ramifications of such a dualism. 
In his thesis on Feuerbach, Marx criticizes both the materialism of Feuerbach and the idealism of Hegel for including the idea that being an individual human is, in the first instance, an object of um, consciousness or intuition, Anschauung, like Sabina was talking about, badly translated as contemplation. Um, I'm going to start this sentence again. So, you know, Marx is worried about the, the idea that being an individual human is, in the first instance, an object of Anschauung, to which the object, uh, to which object, the activity of being a practical thinker is counterposed. There's an underlying point for Marx here, I think, about the nature of our knowledge of ourselves as a manifold of living individuals. If this knowledge is treated, however implicitly or in part, as somehow theoretical and had by each of us individually, then a dualism opens up between a single self-conscious subject on the one hand and a manifold of unself-conscious animals on the other. As Marx puts it in his criticism of Hegel, in, of Hegel in The Poverty of Philosophy, instead of the ordinary thinker with his ordinary manner of thinking, we have nothing but this ordinary manner, purely and simply, without the individual. Our practical rationality seems to take on a life of its own then, and we can no longer think it together with our animality. One. That was a lot of it. That was his assertion. I'll say more about why you should think. <laughs> um, so, w w if this diagnosis were right, I mean, and I'm not giving you any reason to think that it is yet, uh, we see that the real, the real problem would be one of dual, wouldn't be one of dualism. The underlying, oh, that's a reflection of a more <laughs> fundamental problem. The underlying problem concerns a conception of our man membership of the manifold of human beings on which our own membership is known by each one of us theoretically. Uh, what do I mean by theoretical knowledge? I mean, as a formula, theoretical knowledge is knowledge which is not identical with what is known. I mean, that's what I mean by it, but I don't suppose that will help that much. But we can get into it more <laughs> in the q and I guess. Um, so where one's membership of the manifold of human beings and one knowledge of that membership are not, I, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. If that's in place, a theoretical conception of one's knowledge of one's membership of the, you know, the human beings, then I think none, none, of us, none of us could so much as conceive of that manifold, could so much as have the idea of being one amongst many fellow human beings. But we obviously can conceive of that. We do have that idea, and so the knowledge of, we have of being members of this manifold that cannot be theoretical knowledge. Uh, well, why would why does conceiving the knowledge as theoretical have that problem? I'll say something about that briefly, but I mean, it would require a paper on its own, I suppose. But the basic problem is this. If the knowledge is theoretical, that is the knowledge I have, as it were, of not being any of you, <laughs> if that were theoretical, then it could be an open question for me, and it could be an open question for any of you, which human being? <coughs> I am, you could put the question to yourself, which human being am I? This could, be, this could be, in principle, an open question to you. But we can form no idea of what it would be to find an answer to that question. So it can't, it's inconceivable that it ever be an open question for us, and so the knowledge can't be theoretical. That argument's valid, but I, you know, maybe it's not sound, so I'm not going to talk about the premises. <laughs> um, I mean, it's obviously valid because it's just like Tollens, Moses Tollens or something. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'll say something more. Uh, without, I won't go more into the, these thickets here. I, I ju I'll say something more about some initial reactions that the neo Aristotelian or the Hegelian might have to, to some of what I've just said, even without getting into the nuts and bolts of the arguments. Um, in the first instance, what I've just said might just seem like outrageous. Uh, you know, the Neo-Aristotelian, spe specifically in its Thomsonian guise, is, is interested to talk about the, the practical knowledge each of us have of the activities which constitute being human. Because this is not theoretical knowledge. And, you know, the Hegelian is very interested in the, in, in, in the role of uh, mutual recognition in, in our self-knowledge. So, but, so, you know, is it, is it really fair what I'm saying? Um, well, first thing I want to say is that one must be clear here about what the knowledge in question is that I'm interested in. It, it's, it's that knowledge which, as I, that knowledge which as, as I would put it, I have of not being the very same human being as any of you. Uh, and in the end, I think even sophisticated views, including, say, Hegelianism, end up positing a very special mode of awareness which each one of us has only of ourselves, 
with, that, with the knowledge we have then being based on that special awareness. So the knowledge is got by us, as it were, one by one. <clears throat> I won't do more to substantiate this claim, but like, I, I, I urge you to reflect on the role of uh, the, the concept sensuous desire plays in Kant and, and Hegel, um, special kind of awareness we have of ourselves in the first sense of being a desiring one. And then, and then we both, then we want to kill each other and then the state. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the knowledge which each of us has of being the one that we are, one amongst others, must itself be, I think, nothing other than our being the one that we are, so, uh, for each of us. That is, the knowledge must be our activity of keeping ourselves in existence as a human being. <clears throat> I think this is what Marx thinks. Marx avoids the, the opening up of a dualism because he insists, I, I believe, that the knowledge which each of us has of being human, which each of us humans has, of being one living individual and a manifold of others, all of the same kind, must itself be practical. The knowledge for Marx just is a mutual activity of ours, which includes elements of production and care, by engaging in which together we humans maintain ourselves as what we are. Uh, I think Marx's distinctive conception of human history and his own critical project are rooted in this very understanding of being human, as namely an inherently mutual and so shared activity of self-conscious, self-maintenance. Um, I've just asserted that the activity must be, must be mutual. Um, I, I won't say very much more about that, except I want to say, uh, I think the fact that the activity would have to be mutual in a very profound sense, that we humans are together in a very profound sense, just follows from the fact that being human is self-conscious. Um, it's, uh, it's an activity in which each who engages in it relates to the others, I to thou. I won't try to defend that step because I think uh, Aristotle and Hegel just agree. Um, the, the bone of contention between Marx, Aristotle and Hegel doesn't, doesn't concern that step. It really concerns what it would be to concern, conceive of that activity as one of self-maintenance. You know, uh, Marx is basically thinking, if the activity of being human uh, is a matter of living off the labor of others whilst esteeming one another's virtue or respecting one another's right, then we don't yet have before us a conception of mutual self -main mutual maintenance. <clears throat> To develop such a position, you know, this idea of mutual maintenance, uh, uh, self, yeah. one might turn to two different, albeit connected, research areas, contemporary scholarship on Marx and contemporary critical theory. However, despite there being much to learn from both of these research areas, I think, there exists within them the possibility for reproducing versions of the neo-Aristotelian Hegelian choice, which I described above. And with my uh, advocated return to Marx, I wish to overcome a restriction to, this, to just this choice. Um, how, how much time do I have left, roughly? Okay. I'll try to whiz through the business about Marx scholarship and critical theory. <clears throat> the philosophical inheritance of Marx has been marked by the questions whether if so, how Marx criticizes the specific institution of capitalism. I think that we can then delineate two strands of Marx interpretation, one broadly Aristotelian, one broadly Hegelian, which appeal to different conceptions of being human, and which return, in effect, different answers to the question what badness could mean when, as these interpretations maintain, Marx does claim that the institutions of capitalist society are bad. On the Aristotelian reading, Marx was committed to generic claims about what we humans do principally perhaps that we produce cooperatively, relative to which claims the institutions of capitalism were said by Marx to be inhumane and thus bad. Um, Marx's innovation, it is said, is an insistence that our productive labor must itself be a site of mutual recognition and a correlative refusal to allow that mutual recognition only occurs between those who have private property in land. On this way of reading Marx, laboring cooperatively is said to be a specific activity in which we humans engage, and its description to us is formally similar to the description of summer fishing to grizzly bears. Just as a particular grizzly bear which is kept in a zoo must and, must and yet cannot fish for salmon in the summer, so, in effect, a particular human who lives in a capitalist society 
must and yet cannot labor cooperatively with their fellows. The neo-Aristotelian reading of Marx contrasts with an earlier Hegelian reading, which adopts more from Hegel than the idea that we humans are such to recognize each other. This tradition attributes to Marx a broadly Hegelian conception of reason that takes, him, takes Marx to reach conclusions which are more radical, politically speaking, than those of Hegel himself, at least in the philosophy des Reiches. Here Marx is said to inherit the idea of reason as an overarching system, uh, which we humans are to realize in our history by overcoming forms of otherness. The goal is for mutually external elements, sensibility and understanding in an, in an individual, ancient city-states and modern nations over historical time, to be comprehended together as internally related moments of a greater unity. For Hegel himself, according to this reading, the process is itself properly logical in some sense, and it is thus uninterruptible. It extends temporally, but only from the past up to the present, where it has of necessity completed itself. For Marx, however, the dialectical process of reason is said to remain unfinished in the present and to anticipate a different future. Liberal modernity is said to be riven with contradiction, with the legal persons which it contains opposing themselves to each other as competing individuals. For Marx, in this reading, totalizing reason itself requires us humans to suspend this situation in the name of equity between us. You might associate this view with Lukács or Marcuse of Reason and Revolution. I think these interpretations of Marx saddle him with the dualism. We can take up our standpoint. Of, we can take up the standpoint of practical rationality, provided with content either by our given species or by its own historical self-development, while passing judgment on our individual animal selves who, by participating in capitalist institutions, <coughs> fail to conform to that. Alternatively, we can take up the standpoint of our animal selves in our empirically known march through history, so to speak, whilst ignoring the claims of practical rationality as an overhanging irrelevance to that. On either view, it seems to me we cannot think our practical rationality and animality in one. We provide ourselves as philosophers with no understanding of how we humans could be such as to oppose ourselves in being practically rational animals to those forms of domination which characterize capitalist society. Not every neo-Aristotelian or, or, or Hegelian is going to take that to be a desideratum on, on their theory, right? The issue in a, a priori justification of why capitalism is terrible. But I mean, I, I take it it's a constraint on a good interpretation of Marx that this somehow comes out. Five minutes left. <clears throat> Must go faster. Um, contemporary critical theory is one of the inheritors of Marx. And one question which it may be said to have, one question which it may be said to have concerned itself with is the meaning of the concept bad insofar as we humans apply it to those practices of ours, capitalist or otherwise, which we wish to condemn and replace. Critical theory may thus be seen as a contribution to a kind of social self-understanding. Relatedly, the idea has become current that it is the business of critical theory, at least in part, to elucidate a concept of life which gets applied by us humans, however implicitly, in our critical orientation towards our own practices. Now, Marx himself has been presented by contem some contemporary critical theorists in the neo-Aristotelian guise, which I sketched above. The question for me, then, is whether contemporary critical theory provides a better understanding of being human, through which the unity of our practical rationality and animality may be understood, and from which understanding our critical orientation towards economic domination makes sense. The danger, I think, is that without the availability of another interpretation of Marx, the role which our humanity plays in our social critical judgments is apt to be understood in either either a neo-Aristotelian or a Hegelian way. An advocate of a broadly neo-Aristotelian approach, bad will apply to those practices of ours which are at odds with our species' characteristic activities. With that species being understood once again as just one practically rational life form amongst possible others. For an advocate of a broadly Hegelian approach, by contrast, our humanity would be conceived as an historically developed set of practices, participation in which we are habitu which we're habituated into, wherein we recognize each other's rights as equal persons rather than simply pursuing the satisfaction of our own sensuous desires. There's a paper by J.M. Bernstein criticizing Michael Thompson. I think he lands somewhere like that. Now, the worry with the Neo-Cetelian approach is that if our own kind were, by our own lights, one practically rational life form amongst possible others, then it's not clear why it would be something which all of us humans would, in thinking practically, have committed ourselves to realizing. Perhaps some of us are wrong about its content, perhaps some of us fail to care about its realization. 
the worry with the Hegelian approach. By contrast, is that it does not capture how our humanity could figure for us in a genuinely critical orientation towards our own practices. Here, the basic practices constitutive of being human are, at least, those public institutions in which we recognize each other as originally self-concerned beings, namely, the institutions of private property, in, for example, the means of production, exchange on an open market, and the legal administration of such a market. It's hard to see in that case why our knowledge of our kind must express itself in a critical orientation towards the forms of economic domination which are definitive of capitalism. The underlying problem with both approaches, I think, is that they import the dualism of our practical rationality and animality. Being practically rational agents on either view, we humans confront ourselves with the question whether to maintain given practices of ours. But on neither picture could our animal nature, somehow distinct, play a meaningful role in answering that question. Either the rational bearing of our animal nature on the question has been rendered obscure by the neo-Aristotelian approach, or a conception of ourselves as originally self-concerned individuals has been installed in advance as one moment, at least, of what it is to be a practically rational animal, per the Hegelian, I think. <coughs> and then the socially affirmative character of any answer to the question has already been settled. Okay, so now this is all supposed to uh, uh, butter you up for the idea that we need to return to Marx, and I will end with a cascade of bare assertions. <coughs> I th Again, I think Marx had a diagnosis of what lies behind the appearance of a dualism between our practical rationality and animality at the level of philosophical theory, whatever he also thought about how living in capitalism makes such theory plausible to us. Uh, and I think Marx had some conception of how we as philosophers are to think differently in order to avoid the dualism. Again, I think that for Marx, the problem is some version of the idea that the knowledge which each of us has of being a living individual, one human amongst others, is at least partly empirical or theoretical and had by us individually. Instead, Marx thinks that such knowledge must originally be practical. Itself a mutual activity of ours, including elements of production and care, by engaging in which we, we humans maintain ourselves together as what we are. It's by fully acknowledging the social character of human living then, we philosophers comprehend how it can be that in us humans, practical rationality and animality are the very same thing. A few more remarks and then I will stop. Um, <clears throat> so, so construed Marx, although an avowed student of Aristotle and Hegel, would be seen to be no less original in comparison to them than they were in comparison to Plato and Kant. Um, indeed, I think with this interpretation of Marx, we further our understanding as philosophers, of how it can be that we humans, simply as such, orient ourselves against domination and towards sharing the activities of production and care through which we all live. A few more, more a couple more remarks now, and I'm done. Okay. Um, so for Marx, uh, we humans are, simply are, our own self-consciously mutual work, and it therefore has been possible for us to act out fundamentally confused conceptions of our activity of living. Abstractly stated, it has been possible for us to act out conceptions of human life on which it consists in groups of mutually independent and competing individuals who, whilst engaged in their own self-directed life activity, all respect and esteem each other as members of such a group, you know, citizens of a polis or a nation state, that is, with property and the means of production, whilst other humans must work for the members of these groups in order to survive, slaves, namely, or wage laborers. These arrangements are inhumane, Marx thinks, but for us humans to criticize them in this way is for us to seek clarity about our own rational animality, to achieve which clarity is ultimately for us to rule out through mutual activity incoherent articulations of our own living. Um, I think that Marx thinks that through our self-conscious interrelation as living individuals, each one of us simply is humanity. As he puts it, a totality of vital human expression, of expression, the present living species, as if from the Paris manuscripts. And the solidarity between us humans is what rational animality simply is. Marx's point then is not that cooperative manual labor is somehow characteristic of us in the way that summer fishing is characteristic of grizzly bears. Being human is everywhere social, and Marx project, precisely rejects the idea that we humans are to determine our common nature with institutions in which we recognize each other as equally self-concerned individuals. In a sense, then, our rejection of confused conception of our living is logical, according to Marx, but it is equally an opposition which we mount in our very living. We humans suffer in having made contradictory attempts at self-conscious living. We, overcome such, we have overcome, to an extent, such attempts by acting together against class division. Uh, such opposition has been and will be, I think, Marx thinks, are historically informed class struggles. You know, the 
to be human is to, to participate in <laughs> The reality of being human consists in our past, past struggles, and they're, and they're going to have to be more of them. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Alec, for your very interesting talk. I would like to open our discussion now. Uh, yeah, Anton Ford. Hi, Alec. Um, so I want to ask about, um, I mean, uh, a question about hi how history is related to the um, slogans that you're... Um, putting up there for us. Um, like one criticism one might have of the neo-Aristotelian program, um, a criticism you might especially have if you're um, uh, one of the Hegelians, is that it, history doesn't play any real role in talking about what about the human. Um, it may as well be a grizzly bear um, for whom there's not something like history. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, you know, from, from the perspective of that concern, one might also be concerned with um, some of the slogans that you're putting forward that, um, you know, and also the, you know, that, you know, mutual self maintenance, that, that mutual self, that, 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 that the human being maintains that all human beings are, you know, are 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 in are now in the business of um, doing things that maintain all human beings is, you know, itself you know, new, recent, um, hasn't always been. It hasn't always been the case that people living around here and people living on the opposite side of the world were engaged in anything together that maintained the all humans. Um, but we are now, and so. Um, so the slogans, the slogan. So I'm. So my question is, how? It, it's. It, it's. It was always true that the humans around here and the humans over there were socially re reproducing. Uh, that's that's true. But the the unit of reproduction wasn't humanity. Um, that's sort of the point. Um, um, and so. Um, I just wonder how your thinking uh, history comes into these slogans, and just one more, like an, you know, another way of putting the, the the point, like the knowledge that you, with this this puzzle that you, or this question that you asked, just to reflect on the knowledge that I that knowledge that I have that each of us has um, that you know I'm not you or whatever. I mean, like that, you know, that kind of thing. That's like a very I suppose that 100,000 years ago, like everyone had that knowledge as well. But although all sorts of stuff about um, humanity being a self-reproducing whole was not true. So yeah, how, how, does the, how does the emergence of humanity, the historical emergence of humanity as the unit of human reproduction, um, which I would take to be a very important part of Marx's thought, um, figure into uh, the interpretation of your slogans? Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah, this is working. Um, good. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and so good I don't have a satisfying answer to it. I mean, but <clears throat> it's an artifact of the way I have approached this material that the marks I end up presenting looks less historical, less concerned with history than uh, than I think he, he really is. Um, I, I do think it's true that Marx has this conception of the knowledge which each of us human beings has of being one amongst others. Um, and so that's, and you're right, that's his ahistorical. I mean, that's, that, that's been there always. And I, and I, and I, and I want, um, I want that, I think there is such a um, adamantine point that's at the core of <laughs> his thinking. Uh, you know, none of us can doubt that. <laughs> that's why. Um, okay. But I'm thinking that, uh, the the the, the I, it's, it's a super abstract statement of mutually um, uh, mutually maintaining, and this is what what it would be to be one of the mutually maintainers <laughs> is going to be to be in, in human history. I'm thinking is is to be uh, is to be against 
class domination and for communism. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm at least thinking that somehow implicitly even back then they were in some sense for communism. Uh, as we as we are now, but we're not. We're not. This isn't a communist society. You, you're right. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's one way of understanding what it would be for the human to be reproducing the human. Uh, 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 Marx calls it, has this phrase at one point in the press is "Gesamtwerken," you know, all round the all round <laughs> actualization of human being. And you might think, well, what that would be is only then in communism. In which case, even the world market isn't yet the Gesamtwerken, the <laughs> Mensch science or whatever. Um, so I, I, I'm going. I'm, in response to your question, I'm going to have to say, well, there's one sense in which we're, the human is, you know, as such, oriented towards <laughs> the human reproduction of the human, even though what that comes to is going to involve a kind of have to be instantiated historically via the opposition of certain forms of class opposition and ultimately the realization of communism. I'm thinking. I suspect that doesn't satisfactorily answer. <laughs> the, I, what I said is what I think, but whether it, yeah, whether it answers the question. I think. Thanks a lot, uh, Karen and Jim. Um, thanks so much for that. I want to push you a bit on this issue of dualism Good. because it seems to be it, it, it's the way that you diagnose it. Sort of, it, you, you you diagnose it across the board, and you did signal at one point that maybe there's something question begging going on here. But instead of trying to defend. Neo Aristotelians and Hegelians as non dualist. Maybe I want to think about um, recent uh, scholarship on Marx that, that actually wants to stress that a certain form of dualism is crucial for its critical force. Um, that there is not, there is of course not an ontological dualism in Marx, but that actually being able to draw a distinction, so not your distinction per se between animality and rationality, but certainly between something like nature and society um, is actually crucial to the critical force of Marxism as a program. Um, so I just wanted to hear you maybe be a little bit more precise about the kind of dualism that you're diagnosing. You also at one point made a passing comment about, you said you want the unity of rationality and, and, and animality, but then you said maybe that's an identity. So I, yeah, I, I, I want to hear you say more about the precise sense of dualism that is your concern, and why Marx shouldn't be read as a certain kind, not as an ontological dualist, but as a certain kind of dualist, insofar as we need to maintain a distinction between nature and society in order to even understand um, anything about historical materialism or dialectic. You can't really have dialectic at any, without at least two terms. Thank you. Um... I have some things to say, which I hope are more, I hope are more satisfactory than some of the other things I suspect of. So, the dualism of, again, the dualism I'm concerned with is the dualism of our animality and our practical rationality. So that's like bracketing questions of nature more, more broadly, but that's still pretty abstract, and it may be too too abstract to me. Part of the difficulty here is the way this dualism gets thought about depends on thinker of thinker, and it, thinker to thinker, and it comes out in, I think, for example, Kant and Hegel in a certain opposition of rationality to uh, sensuous desire. Um, sensuous desire is a bit of a catch-all term, which they'll then throw loads of words into need, impulse. Uh, they, they don't really care. It's just dirt to be opposed. Um, <clears throat> empirical dross. Um, so, yeah... So partly what's going to be at stake in the Marx position, which I think I describe as an identity, it's like in a way he's going to be undermining their idea of uh, sensuous desire, Kant's called the pathological, it's outside. Um, that's going to get opposed. It's a little bit hard to get more concrete without begging certain questions against one or another thinker. That, that I, I suppose that won't be that satisfactory, but I want to say something which I hope will be a bit more satisfactory about the, um, the other thing you said, there's, you said, well, look, some people think it's, it's um, Marx's critical project requires some kind of uh, dualism between nature and society. And I don't know whether that's true, but there's, there's certainly a dualism, which I'm, I myself think is a, one, a good one to recognize, and I think Marx does recognize, and that's the dualism between ourselves and the wider nature in which we live. Um, you know, what Marx calls our, you, know, you know, all nature is in our inorganic body, but you know, that stuff of which we live, that, that's not other human beings. 
Yeah, so the, there's our habitat, if you like, which is all nature, which is in a way of saying it's not a habitat. But you know, the, we, uh, the tree is not my fellow. Yeah, and so like whilst it may be uh, in our collective interest not to burn all the trees, nevertheless, there's a different kind of interest <laughs> in my interest in you. And so I think there is a dualism in Marx, which may mark him out as a certain kind of humanist. Which kind of humanist I'm thinking is a good humanist kind of humanist to be? Um, uh, yeah, so there's a difference between what it is to, for me to relate to you as a fellow and me to relate to bits of my environment as my habitat. Right? That's our dualism. That's what I was tr mapping onto your distinction between nature as an outer nature and society, namely us. That, that, that's the dualism I'm happy with. I, I don't know whether it's what you had in mind, but that's... Yeah. Thank you very much. We have a further question from Lea Iti. Hi, thank you. I'm still trying to understand the difference between the Marxian and the Hegelian account. And maybe uh, with instead of asking you to just clarify it more, I wanted to maybe ask you to talk about alienation a bit and how you see the differences in these two accounts. Because it seems to me in the Marxian account, the way you present it, alienation would be this inability to see yourself or to set yourself critically vis-a-vis -vis social practices. And in Hegel, it would be something like that, except that that inability would itself come from social practices. And it sounds to me like you want to say something different. So could you maybe just, by way of clarifying what the differences really are between the two, say something about how you understand alienation in this Marxian account of rationality? <clears throat> I can't say much about how it compares to... I can't speak very professionally to the opposition between Hegel and Marx, because I don't know what... Uh, I mean, it, with respect to the question of alienation, because I don't feel confident enough to say anything about what Hegel thinks about that in general. But I can say something about what I think Marx thinks about alienation. Um, I mean, I, I'd say that for, uh, fundamentally for Marx, alienation is our alienation from one another. And so I think that uh, uh, what it, it, uh, that the other does not show up for me as my fellow, one whose desires matter to me no less than mine do. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's what I mean. Think alienation is for Marx. I don't think that's what alienation is for Hegel because what I just said. The other's desires don't matter to me as much as mine do. Is partly the partly a characterization of what private right is, and uh, Hegel, uh, you know, Hegel doesn't abolish that, right? I mean, the whole system makes is meant to paper over the cracks, but it includes it, you know. Alfheben is suspension, whereas for Marx, it's going to be getting rid of. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, yeah, that doesn't. There's depths to your question which I've not uh, responded to, but that's what first pass what I say. Thank you very much. We have a further question from Alexei. Yeah, thank you, Elliot, for your talk. Um, I'm interested. I don't know. Is this? Yeah, I'm interested um, in the in einem in the rationality and animality in one. Um, it it uh, sounded a little bit, but I'm sure that I get it wrong, as if you showed some problems of uh, Aristotelian accounts and Hegelian accounts. And they are stuck within a dualism, whereas Marx finds a solution for the, for this theoretical puzzle. And I was wondering now in your reading, is this unity or identity of rationality and, and melody already the case? Is it, or does it uh, has to does it have to be achieved or actualized, or is it is it the case already, and it's just the best theoretical? expression of human nature, or is it something to be actualized yet? Both. <laughs> I mean, uh, is, as it were, the, the, the air is thin when one gets to these logical heights or something. In the, it's like hard to say. I, don't, you know, it was the, I, I find my tendency is to want to pose a question in the kind of dilemmatic form you did, and one has to somehow find one's way to re resisting this. Um, I mean, I want to say, on the one hand, if, if human being were not uh, the, the kind of unity that I'm saying it is, and where that was already a kind of solidarity, we would never have made it this far. We would already all be dead. Uh, there has been good enough mothering, as Winnicott puts it. There has been friendship, you know, 
uh, without any of this, I doubt human beings would have made it this far. You know, there's lots of interesting topics under the label care, which philosophers have refused to think about for a long time, without which uh, uh, we, would, no, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't even be here talking. Um, so in some sense, humanity ha must have been present, <laughs> and yet, nevertheless, it's not here yet, because we're not under communism. So I think, I think that. <laughs> now, that just sounds like I'm asserting a contradiction, and I, I know, and so I... I want to get us to the point, as it were, where we realize we have to say something that sounds mad like that, and then we spend our time figuring out how to make it sound less mad. The goal is to bring us to the point of seeing, fuck, we have to say this thing that sounds contradictory. Uh, now what? Yeah. So this is a way of not, not answering your question, really. But yeah. Thanks a lot. We have a question from Sufi. Thank you. So maybe I'm, I'm asking a similar question uh, again. It's a question about the, the structure of your argument for Marx, um, and I think it's in part a clarificatory question, but then I also have a hard time reconciling two of the themes that you're talking about. Um, so I take it the, the overall structure of the argument is you start out with a particular self-conception that we have of ourselves as practical thinkers, combining both the rationality and the animality bit, um, and then it turns out that Marx gives us the best explanation for the possibility of, of that self-understanding or self-conception, right? Almost like a transcendental argument. We have this self-understanding, how is it possible? Well, Aristotle doesn't do it, Hegel doesn't do it. Marx gives us um, the possibility um, of, of that self-understanding. Now, my first question is, is, is that a more or less accurate characterization of the, of the argumentative strategy that you're pursuing? Um, and, and if yes, I guess another version of the question that has just been asked comes up if, if self-knowledge in practical activity through mutual maintenance and, and so on is a precondition for our self-conception, self-understanding as um, practical thinkers, one among many, and, and so on. Um, I mean, that also sounds a lot like communism, right? Self-knowledge as a kind of practical knowledge in mutual maintenance um, and, and, and so on. But if you want to explain the possibility of our self-conception through communism, the, the obvious problem is and I guess it's a version of the previous question, we don't have communism, right? So how is our, how is our self-conception possible in a non-communist society um, if, if that's the structure of, um, of, of the argument? Yeah, you're right. Sadly, we don't yet have communism in one sense. You know? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, clearly, in, 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 one, in, in an important sense, we don't yet have it. And other than an aside on whether we have communism or not, you know, David Graeber's book, uh, Debt, he talks about you know, everyday communism or something. It's like fundamental form of human togetherness. It's like, well, it's a kind of ground form of the way humans relate to one another, where, you know, the question is implicitly always, uh, from, you know, the, the, the principle is, you know, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. And Grave was like, well, it's not the only one. People have engaged in the business of rights, et cetera, et cetera. But he's like, without that one, as I said before, we'd all be dead. Uh, so there's a kind of communism <laughs> that we already have, uh, but, you know, there's a, um, it's not somehow fulfilled itself, that phrase is opaque. Um, um, uh, now you asked about the structure of the argument. Is it, you're, you're right that if there was a transcendental condition on our having some bit of present knowledge that some future state be the case, that would be loopy. Yeah, so that, I, I don't think that. Um, the, 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 the argument was kind of transcendental in a sense where I was like, um, well, the argument is against the argument against the, the opponent's views is, is in a certain way transcendental in so it's like to assume that the knowledge which each of us had of being the one that we are, one amongst others, was theoretical. Um, it, not, it turns out none of us could even conceive of ourselves to be the one that we are. So it can't be theoretical. So it has to be practical. I mean, I, that, that, maybe that's a kind of transcendental argument. Um, um, yeah, but then, so there has to be some kind of mutual related one to the other in order for us to know this, but there's, there, it's not as it were fulfilled itself. And now everything, you know, I appreciate that when I say it's not yet fulfilled itself, that's where all the mystery is contained in this phrase <laughs> by which I'm saying, yeah, it's here, but it's not. But uh, in a way, I'm, I'm wanting to insist that we have to get, get to the point where we will find ourselves saying something like that in order to be saying, A, something that's true, and B, something that Marx thinks. Uh, we have a last question uh, from Thomas Quirano. Okay, thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask you about uh, one element of your critique of the Hegelian view. 
Um, and at some point you mentioned or you, you raised the issue that in a certain sense, the way in which you understand the Hegelian perspective, it does not really make uh, the right room for critique. I wanted to see um, what's the reason for that. So you were, you were mentioning the ways in which Hegel sees modern, the modern capitalist liberal society we live in, and obviously, obviously a certain, certain kind of critique is lacking here. And so, um, but the question is why? So there would be, he could just be wrong in his diagnosis of how social life should work in a certain sense. So he, he just doesn't see the endemic problems of these systems. And so he's, in a sense, empirically wrong, if you will. But I, I was take, I was uh, um, expect, or I was assuming that you had a deeper critique there that, in a certain sense, Hegelian, the, the, the inability to raise a radical critique is endemic to Hegelianism more, 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 uh, more generally, so that it's somehow related to the dualism or some other element. I just wanted to invite you to say some more. So why, why, why this lack of critique in Hegelianism? I'll say two, two, two things. Uh, one about Hegel and one about Hegelianism. Um, one about Hegel, you said, um, you know, maybe he. he um, I, I think he's like made some empirical mistakes or something. I, I, now, there's, an, there's a kind of interpretive principle I have when I'm reading Hegel uh, himself is that, uh, you know, whatever's wrong with the man, it's wrong with this failure of the premises, not the inferences. You know, it's not that his capacity to draw inferences was dodgy. So he could do modus ponens. And to think he couldn't is to be like profoundly uncharitable reader. The difficulty has to go much deeper. Uh, so I think that... Uh, something like what you get in the philosophy of right, Hegel rightly derived from his premises. The problem is the premises. The idea that his premises were good, but he just draws shoddy conclusions from them, I think is not a good way of reading Hegel. That's Hegel. Um, Hegelianism in general, my, you know, uh, why can't it be critical? I mean, there's no, one specific... No, just say what's wrong with the premises. It's fine. So you, you, you answered it's not the, an empirical problem. The What's problem with the Hegel premises? is he has as a premise the fact that each one of us knows ourselves theoretically. Each of us is aware of ourselves as a, as a bearer of sensuous <laughs> desire, and we're given to ourselves as that. That's what's wrong with Can I say something about Can I say, say something again? Because <laughs> um, you, you said I didn't, you said that on my characterization of Hegelianism, uh, then I, and then I did say that they can't be critical, but I, I was more specific. I said for the Hegelian. Um, what looks like it's not going to come into view is what's wrong with the economic forms of domination ca characteristic of capitalism. That's because the Hegelian view, as I characterize it, builds in a certain conception of right, which cannot say what's wrong with, with, with the wage contract, basically. <laughs> you know? So this is what, you know, this is being critical. Yeah, we don't like this practice, we don't like that practice. Nevertheless, you've got to sell your labor power for a wage. I mean, that's what Marx is opposing. <laughs> that's what's got to go, that kind of class domination. And I'm thinking that... No matter how subtle one's Hegelianism, unless one's got that one in one's sights, one's Hegelianism is not a Marxism. No. All right, so that, that, that helps. So, so, but I see then now that it's a more specific argument then on how we understand right. Because if you just have the idea that um, if you have a theoretical perspective on these issues, you cannot be critical, this doesn't strike me as very intuitive. I could have a very theoretical kind of, uh, I mean, think of the Aristotelians you were saying of them, that they have a theoretical conception of our life form as well. Um, but they, they give us a very rich normative account of what the species life should be. And you could compare an existing one to your theoretically conceived one and see how one fails to, fails to fulfill the other. Uh, so so I, I don't see how having a theoretical perspective would undermine the ability to critique. But then there's a longer story, maybe, how, how Hegel's theoretical uh, self-conception produces a certain kind of misguided conception of right that then produces his inability to see what's wrong about capital. That's the ultimate argument, yes. Yeah. OK, helpful. OK, thank you very much. The time at our disposal is over. I would like to thank you a lot for your great talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot for the questions. And we will meet at 2.30 after the lunch break. Thanks.